Good morning, Your Honors. Good morning. Good morning. Richard Joyce, on behalf of the uh, may it please the court, Richard Joyce, on behalf of the appellant AF, who is the mother of the child NF, she has appealed the termination of her parental rights to the child. I'd like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. The issue before this court is because the trial court did not appoint a guardian ad litem for the child. That the pursuant to the case of GS versus Department of Children and Family Services, this court should reverse the final judgment terminating the parental rights of the mother and remand it back to the trial court. Well, let me let me ask you about yes, that Your Honor. because obviously I've read GS. It, because there was no objection below, do you agree that on review you must establish fundamental error? Yes, I do, Your Honor. Okay. And, and, and G, my concern is that in GS, that case was not decided on a fundamental error analysis, so we are in a little bit different posture because GS talked about reversible error as opposed to fundamental error. So it was a different standard of review. It could be, Your Honor. I took it myself as reversible, meaning the fundamental error, because sometimes I've seen it used interchangeably. Yes, that, it's true, and they and, don't go through the facts. And they but, didn't go through a, an analysis. And I, what I would say is that then if you look at the case of CM and the other case it's cited to there, they talk about fundamental error. Well, and they, tell, me, tell me why in this particular case under the facts that we have it would constitute fundamental error. And let me just articulate the facts that are important okay. to me, and then you can tell me why you think that is not enough. Um, in this particular case, when the attorney ad litem was appointed, there was no objection, but the trial court specifically told the attorney ad litem that he wanted her to also represent the best interests of the child. You do have the fact that this attorney ad litem was very involved in the hearing, questioned the witnesses, cross-examined the witnesses, and then ultimately made a recommendation to the trial court regarding the best interests of the child. Tell me why, or what a guardian ad litem would have done that would have been different from what the attorney ad litem, regardless of what we call the person who was appointed, what different, what would a guardian ad litem have done that was different from what this attorney ad litem did? Okay, Your Honor, there's two, they're distinctively different, the attorney ad litem and the guardian ad litem. And there was some confusion because the court said that in the final judgment, pointed for the child's best interest and recommended. Attorney ad litem argued in closing for termination of the child's parental rights, acted as attorney throughout the proceedings, did not act as a guardian ad litem. A guardian ad litem, even as referred to in CM, is a fact finder, a gatherer of information. Even under the rule 8.215, a guardian ad litem may be an attorney ad litem, but they're two distinctively different. Well, there's uh, no question they're different, right. and there's and no question it's air not to appoint a guardian ad litem. But um, so uh, what would the guardian ad litem have done differently? The guardian ad litem differently would have had to gather information, reports to the court, testify. The attorney ad litem did, cannot testify because the attorney ad litem is acting as an attorney. So the guardian ad litem typically testifies at these hearings? Yes, it does, Your Honor. Okay. Pursuant to 39.810, guardian ad litem, it, and I refer back to Florida Rule of uh, Juvenile Procedure 8.215, which says gather, then CM, in that's opinion, said it's an independent source for the court to gather information. Doesn't CM also specifically hold that failure to appoint a guardian ad litem does not constitute fundamental error? Yes, it does. It did distinguish um, between, it did not want to follow GS. They were both decided in 2003, and it declined to follow GS and decided to follow the other two cases, EF and then Fisher versus the Department of Well, oh, but again, GS. No. Yes. Is, is unclear it whether is, it's Honor. fundamental error if there was an objection, but clearly in CM, it's clear that there was no objection and it's raised for the first time on appeal, which seems to be the same issue here, correct? Correct, Your Honor. If, if this court decides that it's not fundamental error and I'm raising it for the first time on appeal, then the Department of Children and Families is correct because they argued in their answer brief or its answer brief that one that it was only being raised for the first time on appeal and then they argued in the alternative that even if it was allowed to be argued for the first time on appeal the attorney ad litem still provided enough protection for the child that the court should affirm the final judgment. But going to Judge Rothenberg's question what about this trial court's failure to appoint a guardian ad litem in this case constitutes fundamental error? Your Honor, I would argue that the basis 
if the mandatory language in the statute says shall appoint, and I know CM says that a parent's position from a child's position is different when we're coming to an appeal, and I, I cannot dispute that. But if we're talking about strict adherence to the statutory requirements for a termination of parental rights, which this is, and it's in, you know, it's the, what has been referred to as the death penalty for a parent, a termination of parental rights, I believe that the court has to adhere to strict statutory um, so any deviation from Chapter 39 would constitute fundamental error in a parental uh, termination of parental rights? Not every, anyone, but I hang my hat on the last sentence of this Court's opinion in GS, which essentially says, while the appointment of a guardian litem may not have resulted in a different outcome, it was a conclusion, it's a, it's a conclusion the Court was unwilling to take. Well, but it also says at the very end of that opinion, it says, in this case, the trial court did not inquire whether a guardian had been appointed to represent DV's interests, did not attempt to appoint a guardian ad litem, and did not determine whether DV's interests were adequ adequately represented throughout the pendency of the proceedings. In our case, um, there was an attorney ad litem appointed, which there wasn't in C C GS, and the trial court did make a finding that the interest of the child was protected by the attorney ad litem. So it's, it's a little different. Yes, it is. And we go back to the mandatory language of the statute. It's in 39807, it's in 39808, and it's in the rule. That that's, that's really your, your argument falls on the statutory language. language that and because and, and, you, you have to concede that the attorney ad litem did represent the interest of the child. I the do concede that, Your Honor. No further questions? Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Joyce. Thank you. Good morning. May it please the court, Carla Perkins for the department. Um, it's not actually in the record, but the record does reflect that the mother was a minor in foster care at the time. No, we're she aware had of the that. baby. In the record. That, it's it's, it's in, in the record. record. We're no, that, that part's in the record. What's not in the record is why the Guardian Program wasn't representing this baby. But what happens is when they represent a minor mother, usually they have to conflict out if she has a baby. So, well, but that, I don't think that that avoids the statutory requirement of appointing a guardian ad litem. You just have to appoint, you may have an attorney ad litem, but you still then have to appoint a guardian ad litem. They serve different functions generally. The problem is that the attorney ad litem holds that title because of the guardian program holding the title of guardian ad litem attorney. Sorry. <clears throat> is this a financial issue? No, 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 no. Uh, it's not it, financial. It's it has to do with the guardian program conflicting it's out. It's a conflict. It's, it's almost because like because they represented counsel? the mother. The mother of the baby was a minor I see. at the and time could, the baby they, was born and in the system. So because they represented the mother. They can't represent the baby. So can you not rep can the, the trial court not appoint then someone, a private attorney, to act as a guardian ad litem? The way the system seems to work, because I've dealt with like lawyers for children in America in these cases before too, where if the guardian program conflicts out, I've seen like guard, um, lawyers for children for America and you know, this one here um, from legal aid. So it looks like they look to organizations that deal with... But they come in as attorney ad litems as opposed to guardian ad litems. It, it's strange because they do come in supposedly to <laughs> represent... That's why the court in the final judgment did put that this attorney ad litem was there to represent the best interests of the child. But, but, but you, you would agree that the attorney ad litem, unlike a guardian ad litem, is not subject to cross-examination, does not present facts has a different role, and certainly in this case, had a different role than what's contemplated under 39.808 for a guardian ad litem. You know, I, I have to kind of respectfully disagree in the sense where this was only a three-year-old, a two- to three-year-old child, so they can't do the express wishes of the child. And if you look, actually, Dr. Munson, one of the witnesses, she actually testified, the February 19, 2014 transcript, she testified, page 63 reflects that she did speak with the attorney ad litem. So the attorney ad litem was involved prior to the trial in terms of talking with witnesses also. So it's clear that she wasn't just an attorney that was there at the trial that did cross-examination. She actually even called the foster mother as a witness too, who provided some of the manifest best interests. Is there any prohibition or problem with appointing under circumstances like this where the trial court appoints an attorney ad litem 
to also appoint that attorney ad litem to serve as a guardian ad litem. If the trial court had said, other, rather than saying, I also, also want you to represent the best interests of the child, if the trial court had said, I'm appointing you as both the attorney ad litem and guardian ad litem, would that have been permissible under the rules? You know, I've actually seen someone acting as both the attorney and testifying as the guardian. So I've seen that before, but because of the problem here with the guardian program, it looks like they, they have this method and that's what they do. So that's why we have the attorney ad litem, but. But is, is the guardian ad litem program, it's, you only can register through the guardian, I guess when you have the public defender's office and there's a conflict, then it goes to either regional counsel or you can have separate counsel, right. hire separate counsel. So I, I, I think this is the first time we've heard of this problem with the guardian ad litem program where there's a minor who is a parent and then there's a problem appointing. Did the minor mother have a guardian also? That must have been why they had to conflict out. Because the guardian program, the guardian program has guardians. They recruit guardians. So they obviously had a guardian on that case, the mother's case. And so that's why they conflict out with her baby because she's still in the foster care system. They've represented her, so they can't go into court and argue, you know, or testify against her interests because they represent her. So put so another way, if there was a contemporaneous objection that no guardian ad litem had been appointed as required by chapter 39 what would or could the trial court have done to address that objection i think the trial court probably would have then had to find a private lawyer or a private person then to come in to serve as the guardian ad litem outside of the the, the jail operation but you know i'd like to point the court to 39 8, 10, which is really when they bring the guardian in, the guardian really addresses manifest best interest. And it's only really one factor of manifest best interest that the guardian really addresses. And 39A1011 talks about the recommendations for the child provided by the child's guardian ad litem or legal representative. So if you look at 39A10, which is the critical component that the guardian is involved with, it does say legal representative. So while you have the provision before that says appoint the guardian, I think the court by appointing the attorney ad litem to act as a guardian, despite her title, she still did her duties in talking to people before the trial. So at the time of the trial, because she was the one who really questioned even the foster mother. So obviously there had been prior communication with her. Dr. Munson also testified to that. Involved in the case, at trial, she did her job, but she also did the recommendation, which is what 39 8, 10, 11 says, recommendation from the legal representative too. So well, the one thing she didn't do that a guardian would normally do is present a report to the trial court. If the reports that they file. Correct. Yeah. But you know, the bottom line really is when you look at these trials, they're looking to see whether manifest in best interests was proven. And if you look at the evidence from the different witnesses who even testified as to different factors, because manifest best interest doesn't really come from the guardian only. I think a lot of times, you know, there's a focus on the guardian and thinking everything in terms of manifest best interest. Now the best trial interest court considers everything, the evidence and the Correct. recommendations by the guardian. Correct. So the firm asks that you affirm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Perkins. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes. Thank you. And, and to respond to Judge Scale's question, I do not believe that an, an attorney can act contemporaneously as a guardian ad litem and an attorney ad litem because they're two distinctively different situations. You cannot be an attorney and then be subject to cross-examination because you, you just can't draw that line. It's pretty line. tough to change your hat <laughs> in the middle of the It is very difficult, I would say. So, but I would say it's, it's purely a statutory argument. Uh, the other cases seem to think that it's not fundamental error. I concede that GS could probably be read either way. But once again, if you're dealing with a parental rights, termination of parental rights, and you're required by, uh, for strict adherence to the statutory requirements to get to that point, I would say that the guardian ad litem of the legislature established it shall appoint, then the court has to appoint the guardian ad litem. And if there's that defect in the proceeding below, then it should constitute fundamental error, and then this matter should be reversed. Thank you. Thank you very much.